more than many other days, we heed that command. We refuse to live by any other thing than our faith in what you have said. We are here tonight living unafraid and unaffected in the name of Jesus. Not because we are anything, but because you are everything. And you have done everything. You already took upon yourself the curse. You already took upon yourself the full weight, the full brunt of our sin. You already bore in your body the stripes that paid for every sickness and for every disease. And so, Lord, we thank you, Father. Glory to God that there is here tonight a Gideon army. When Gideon showed up facing those enemies, I think they had close to 30,000 people assembled. God said, that's too many. That is too many. So he said, what do you want me to do? And he said, well, I want you to tell everybody that's afraid to go home. And uh, so a bunch of them left. I mean, the vast majority of them were afraid. Now, why would God say if they're afraid, go home? Well, because fear is contagious. It's not the virus that's really that scary out there. It's the fear that they've got attached to it. So he said, I can't use you if you're afraid. I'm sorry. You just tell them to go home. We'll win this battle without them. And then, and then he said, well, you still got two men. I said, what do you want me to do? He said, well, let them all go down to the pond and get a drink. And I want you to watch how they drink water. And if they get down, they set their weapon down. They get down on their haunches and they, they, they're not paying attention. And they lap water like that. You send them home. But the ones that stay crouched and they're looking around, they're paying attention and they lap water with their hand, said, you keep them. They had about 300 of them left. God used those 300 to defeat a mighty army. Hallelujah. You know, our Bible say that faith is the victory. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Come on, and it's, tr it's as true today as it was yesterday. It's as true today as it was when the stock market was at 30,000. Right? Amen. Glory to God. So just put your praise on. Turn your news off. Can I just help you real quick? Because be, we get the prophet up here and you'll be distracted thinking about what they're going to close tomorrow. Well, you'll wake up and find out. Whatever, whatever's going to close tomorrow, you'll still be all right. Amen. You already stocked up on toilet paper. I know you did. <laughs> Again, I'm not endeavoring to make fun, but people are wigged out. I mean, they're just wigged out. And I just want to say to you, God's got this. Yes, amen. Right? I don't know where you're living, but I'm sitting at the table. <laughs> and there's a table even here tonight. And you got a chair at that table. And it's not hidden away from all that's going on. God says right in the middle of sickness and disease, fear and doubt, enemies all around. That's where I set your table. And there's healing on the table. There's supply on the table. Come on. There's healing. There's deliverance on the table. Lord, there's peace. There's security. So tonight, for the next several minutes, I, what I want you to do is pull up to the table. Focus what's on the table. And let the enemy just run wild around you and just act like he's not there. Your life goes where your attention goes. I really hadn't looked at the news this afternoon. They tell me some things were announced or whatever for other states. I don't know about Kentucky yet. Really don't care. 
I'm just telling you what I'm doing. Amen. Unless there is a announcement that carries the weight of constitutional law, this church be open for business. Amen. You may not have to, you don't have to come, you don't want to, that's whatever. But I'm just telling you where Dr. Jacobs and I and my family will be tomorrow night, Tuesday night. And if the restaurants are closed, we'll have sandwiches and chips and pizza and whatever, and we'll have a good time. I can hear Dr. Jacobs, simmer down. <laughs> simmer down. But I mean, really, we, we're not endeavoring to just, uh, you, know, you know, you almost get accused of being flippant. I'm not about that. Jesus said, if you're not careful, Luke 21 your heart will be like many out there. Their heart will fail because of what they see coming on the earth. And I'll let Dr. Jacobs speak to this, but I just happen to believe that what we're dealing with now is small potatoes compared to what we're likely to see come upon the earth before the catching away. So take this moment as practice. I know it's different. I know it's different from what, I've never experienced anything like this in all my life. So much pandemonium over, well, nobody's bleeding out their eyes. Right? Amen. So, practice living undisturbed. I'm not taking credit for that statement. I got that listening to doctor on his podcast. You need to practice every day of your life living undisturbed. Well, pastor, you don't know, I got a terminal, I got a terminal disease in my body. Well, number one, you could be healed. Amen. Number two, if you die, you're just going home. That's called promotion. I don't mean to minimize it, but see, you got to deal with the fear. Fear's an enemy. God told Gideon, if they're afraid, I can't use them. You're going to have to send them home. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So we got to get fear out of the way before we start this meeting. Yeah. So right now we just bind it. We bind it. That spirit of fear and doubt. In the name of Jesus. We say you've got no part here. This is not Satan's ground. God gave us this land. This land belongs to the kingdom of God. This building belongs to the kingdom of God. So we command the spirit of fear and doubt to leave this premises in the name of Jesus. You loose each person's mind and heart right now. You loose them and let them go free. You that are watching by live stream, I, I, I want you to be ministered to right now in the name of Jesus. You be at peace right now. You just take yourself a deep breath. You rest. You're in the hand of the Father. We're on an unbreakable blood-bought covenant that's seen worse diseases since the cross than this. We just so thank you, Father God, for your plan for tonight's service. We set everything aside. We're singling up and focused right now on that which you want us to hear, that which you're wanting us to do, to receive, and for you to accomplish in our midst. That's our aim, that's our focus. Have your way, be Lord among us, Jesus. There are people here that need you. There are people here that need healing. There are people here that need deliverance. There are people here that need to hear desperately from you, Father. And that's our aim, that God, that you would have your way and people would be helped. We could leave this place knowing that all of that was accomplished. And that God, that we'll go home, we'll lie our heads on our beds and our peace will be sweet tonight in Jesus name and everybody said amen. amen well you could be seated where you are praise God now keep in mind that not everyone around you might want a handshake today you know Jesus said according to your faith be it unto you so we're not judging anybody or making anybody feel less than at all that's not our intent sometimes just like Dr. Jacobs was being this morning you got to be strong Right, because it's not only strong words, but a strong spirit behind it, and that strength will get in you. I remember 
we were about to sign the bond note that was going to give us the funding to finish our building enough where we could move in. And, you know, like doctor said this morning, it wasn't your name on it. You, I know some of you, a lot of you were with me in faith and loyal to it, the project and everything, but it was my wife and I's name on that thing. And I, I was at uh, a meeting where Dr. Dufresne and Pastor Nancy were ministering out at Dad's church here. And we were in the back room and they happened to seat me across from Pastor Nancy and we were talking and big man of faith, you know, right then. I said, Pastor Nancy, I don't, I don't know if we can do it. And she put her fork down and fire shot out of her eyes. You know, Pastor Nancy. And she said, you can do it. Okay. And I mean something, I'm telling you, talking to you about impartations real quick. Something went down on the inside of me. And from that moment, I never doubted it. And we had that loan for four years. And every year, that payment ramped up. That bond program payment ramped up. I thought, it was a miracle. We could pay it at the lowest level, much less the highest. And God paid that. You know, he's big enough. He just, I said, I'm not going to fast one meal. I'm not going to pray any extra. I need to, and anyway. But the strength of her words, that's what I'm saying. Got in me. Amen. And so you need to let that happen for you as well. Praise God. We're so glad you're here tonight. We're so glad that you're taking part by live stream, whether you're here in Paducah, lying in a hospital room, recovering from surgery, or friends of Dr. Jacobs' ministry in Louisville or around the world. We're so glad to have you. And uh, praise God. I want to do something real quick. We had a brother in our church, precious man. He likes to do this. He likes to buy books so that I could give them away. And so this is Dr. Jacobs' spiritual book, uh, father or spiritual failure book. And uh, they're sold out out on the table. So don't rush, the, don't rush past her here. But, you know, uh, I don't want you to raise your hand in a moment because you want something free. Right. I, want, I want you to raise your hand in a moment and, and attempt to get one of these books. If you're really interested in the revelation, you want to learn, you want to know what it is to be a good spiritual son. For me, I'm living on both sides of this equation. I go over this book several times a year, me personally. Because I want to know I'm a spiritual father to you, some of you. I want to be a good one. So I go to this book to talk to God about it. And then, but I'm a spiritual son too. So sometimes I'll read and I'll walk around and I just say, hmm. Amber caught me one time. She said, what are you doing? I said, well, I was just wondering whether or not I'm a good spiritual son or not. Oh, Okay. <laughs> And I don't think I was ever a bad spiritual son, but see, I'll go, you know, I'll get suggestions, you know. Well, have you ever thought about up in this? Have you ever thought about doing that? Have you ever thought about changing this? Amen. Amen. So anyway, do you want a copy of this book? Okay, I got one to you. I'm sorry. I'm gonna get nobody over here. Okay, so praise God. I'm gonna bless this visiting family tonight. Good to see you, Miss Tanya. Malachi wants one. Anybody else? Barbara, you don't have it. Okay, Jennifer, I'm sorry. Glory to God. I got an extra copy in my library, brother. I'll get you one, okay? Is that everybody happy? Okay, you don't know. I'm going to take that by faith anyway. Praise Amen. God. <laughs> Open your Bibles, if you would, please, tonight to the book of Philippians, chapter 4. If you were able to be with us this morning, what a rich word that was. And just another thank you from my wife and I's heart, the love and care you guys. That was a first for me, my wife. Nothing ever happened like that before. <laughs> you know, to us, and we're just deeply, deeply grateful to be your pastors. Hallelujah. But um, you remember the sheet he read from towards the end of his message this morning? And he made a statement on that sheet that's really just stuck with me. He said, the way you treat a man of God is going to determine how heaven is going to treat you. Or how you respond to your man of God is how heaven is going to respond to you. What a power. That just really has affected me deeply. And, uh, you know, Paul, if you know any things, you read any, I know you've read this uh, small letter, but such a powerful letter. Paul had a special relationship uh, between uh, himself and this church. And, uh, you know, we love chapter 4. That's where I want you to be. I know I didn't tell you that. Chapter 4. And we love the verse 19. Isn't that right? My God shall supply all of our needs. But see, there was, uh, there's verses before that that, uh, that tell us what prompted the Holy Ghost to say that to this particular group of Christians. You know, um, like Ephesians and Colossians, two totally separate churches, right? 
two totally separate cities, groups of believers. They had separate pastors. But if you read Ephesians and you read Colossians, they almost mirror one another. They are almost mirroring letters. But do you know in none of the other letters that Paul wrote to churches did he say anything close to Philippians 4.19. So how come he said it to them? He didn't say it just that way to the Corinthians. In other letters he repeats things. But this is never uttered. Well, it's because the Philippian church had entered into a fitly joined and compacted partnership with the man of God. Amen. In a way that these other churches hadn't, at least at the time of this writing. And so I just want to read a few verses here, and I'm going to read it from my Amplified Translation, beginning in verse 10, chapter 4, verse 10. Paul said, I was made very happy in the Lord that now you have revived your interest in my welfare. After so long a time, you were indeed thinking of me, but you had no opportunity to show it. Not that I'm implying that I was in any personal want, for I have learned how to be content, how to be satisfied to the point where I am not disturbed or disquieted in whatever state I am. I know how to be abased and to live humbly in straitened circumstances, and I know also how to enjoy plenty and live in abundance. I have learned in any and all circumstances the secret of facing every situation, whether well-fed or going hungry, having a sufficiency and enough to spare, or going without and being in want. What was that secret? Well, to learn to live independent of your circumstances. Learning to live by faith and not by what you see or feel at the moment. Then, of course, he says in verse 13, For I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Skip down to verse 14. But it was right and commendable and noble of you to contribute for my needs and to share my difficulties with me. And you Philippians uh, yourselves know well that in the early days of the gospel ministry, when I left Macedonia, notice this, no church. No church. Now, the Philippians had a pastor, but they're also in partnership with a top-tier Right? Not more important, but just a higher anointing. Amen. And that was the Apostle Paul. Here, I'm I'm wanting you to think about Dr. Jacobs. Amen. See, God moves in rank. I may be your pastor, but see, he's above me. Amen. And we're connected divinely. So this is no church in those early days entered into partnership with me and opened up a debit and credit account in giving and receiving except you only. So do you see, now you can skip to verse 19. See, they were doing something no other church did. They loved him. They cared about him. And when they could find, they see, they didn't have Facebook back then. They didn't have, they didn't have tracker apps. So he'd be gone from their city, and they wouldn't know where he was. Where is he? How is he? Is he okay? But when they found out where he was, they go, ah, we have an opportunity. And they sent supply. And he received it. Amen. He received it. And, uh, well, actually, you could, uh, let me read verse 18 to you. It says, but I have received your full payment and more. I have everything I need, and I'm amply supplied. How many of you want to know that right now tonight, you would hope that Dr. Jacobs has everything he needs? That he's amply supplied. He says, now that I have received from Epaphroditus, and that's the one the Philippians sent with the gifts, and they are a fragrant odor of an offering and sacrifice which God welcomes and in which He delights. I I, I just pray that we give that kind of offering tonight. That when God looks down on it, He says, wow, that's that's got a good smell on it, God said. (laughs) I delight in that. And then the Spirit of God moved upon Paul to say, and my God. Come on, are you getting it? And my God will liberally, that means generously supply, fill to the full your every need. Now what does that mean? Well, I don't know about you, but when I brought Stacy on staff, the needs of the ministry went up. The moment I said, you're on. Mm -hmm. Well, so the need goes up. Guess what happens to supply? He fills it to the full. Amen. Then he he assigns a different project to us. And so the need goes up. Guess what happens to the supply? And this is true in your life. Oh, little Johnny needs sneakers. Well, the need went up. Guess what's going to happen to your supply? Right? Oh, you got college coming up for little Susie. 
Well, praise God, if you need it, that's the plan of God. Guess what? The supply is going to go up if you're rightly connected and engaging. you got a man of God that you're, you're, you're given to, you have a connection with. Amen? Hallelujah. So, you know, it's not a burden to give in another offering tonight. It won't be tomorrow. God ministers seed to the sower and bread for food. Hallelujah. Ushers, if you would come up the aisle. So we're going to take Dr. Jacob's offering right now. We're going to bless him real good. What kind of man of God says, don't give me an offering this morning? Well, a good one. <laughs> Amen. That's what happened this morning. Anyway, we love you, sir. We believe in your ministry, your family. You're a divine rescue in our life. We honor you. Not just the anointing you walk in, but you, the person, the man. And it's a thrill to be able to sow tonight. Amen. Amen. Now, during this meeting, you're going to make all the checks and all just to World Harvest Church of Paducah. And listen, I give you my solemn oath as is usual practice around here. Our church has already underwritten all the expenses. And every single dime we give, praise God, the next four nights here, three nights, whatever, will go right into their ministry. Amen. 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 So, Father, we just so thank you tonight. We're, we hope that what we're giving and how we're giving it becomes a sweet-smelling aroma and sacrifice in your sight, Father. And we know that, Father God, fruit is abounding unto our account. Glory to God. We thank you that we're not just uh, entering into a partnership, a system of giving, and it stops. No, Father God, Paul said, we're engaging in a system of giving and receiving. Giving and receiving. And so right now we're in the giving moment, but in a minute we'll be in the receiving moment. And we just so thank you for all that... God, you're going to use Dr. Jacobs to cause us to hear and to receive. And we just uh, give this offering in faith tonight, believing it's going to come back to us in a multiplied way in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Well, ushers, you could go ahead.
We thank you for your awesomeness, Father. Thank you for your greatness. Thank you for your anointing. Thank you for the name of Jesus. Thank you for the blood of the covenant. Oh, my, 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 my. Thank you for the blood of the covenant. The blood sanctifies us. The blood cleanses us. The blood gives us dominion over all the works of the enemy. The blood of Jesus. And we have faith, Romans 3, we have faith in your blood to preserve us, to redeem us, to deliver us from every evil work and preserve us unto the kingdom. In the name of Jesus, we pray. We thank you, Father, that you're awesome. And we're a part of you, but you're the awesome one. And we thank you for it and praise you for it tonight. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You could be seated. Praise God. Thank you, Dr. Cody. You're always a blessing. You know, your pastors, they feed me when they talk and minister and fellowship with me. I appreciate that. Hallelujah. I know you do too. Yeah. Now, now, I wanted to say something about my materials. We, uh, everything in this particular meeting is half price. So whatever is marked out there, they can, you know, tabulate that. If you're interested in buying something, you know. But now, I'm not sure what I'm going to do in the future. You know, I've had tapes for 30-some years, whatever, maybe 40. But I'm, you can get on the podcast. Or let me say this. You can get on the, oh, shoot. I'm not a real technical person. The website, mm -hmm. Church on the Rock in New Albany, which is where I'm out of. Yes, and then you go down through there and get to MJM. That's me, Michael Jacobs Ministries. And then go to my podcast. And every single tape that I produce that I sell, I don't sell everything, you know, some things just a one-time deal. And, mm -hmm. But anyway, the things that I keep and put on my table, everything, everything that I sell that's got, you know, teaching is on my podcast, it's all free of charge now. So, you know, if you don't want to buy these, you, you know, it's fine with me, but I'm just giving you a discount because I'm carrying some of them with me. I'm not sure what I'm going to do in the future as between me and God, I'm in transition, which means I may do thumbs. Uh, I may not do any of the above, I don't know. I'm writing a lot of books right now, trying to. And um, just I'll just see how the Lord, but so what I'm saying is all of my material that's that I carry, and I don't bring everything with me. I wouldn't want to have to bring three suitcases. But we have a, a piece of paper out there that tells you everything we produce. If you're interested, we have tapes on other subjects that aren't out on the table. Because like I said, I can't bring everything with me. I think I've said enough on that. It, this stuff wears me out a little bit, that technology stuff. God bless you. But this is a good ser a series called Enjoying and Having Long Life. I think there's two CDs. I did an extensive study. I don't know how many years ago this was. I'd like to say 40, but it wasn't. It's was more like 10. And I found that I could live to be 120. And 10 years ago, I was 60. I thought, well, praise God, I'm only halfway home. <laughs> if I want to stay that long. That's the, I'm not sure I want to stay that long, but if I do. But this is having an enjoying long life. We wouldn't be happy to enjoy a long life strapped to a wheelchair living in a nursing home. I'm not critical of anybody. You know, people are sick and sure. sometimes people haven't thought about that until they get 65, they believe God for healing and then you're in trouble. Right. You could get a miracle, probably won't, but you could, but doubtful <laughs> at 65 if you haven't paid attention. So when I was 40, I started thinking about living a long life. That was 30 years ago. So I paid attention to myself and started forgiving everybody. <laughs> Let me just tell you this one line. If you will forgive everybody. It'll take you a long way in your healing. And if you won't, the tormentors are coming. They don't come from God. They come from the evil one. But he'll send plenty of them if you won't forgive everybody from your heart. And Jesus said that. I didn't make it up. So I must be able to forgive everybody from my heart, not from my emotions, but from my heart. And if I'll do it that way, then my emotions will straighten out eventually. I did this series a few years ago. I think it's two CDs too. Uh, Wilt thou be made whole? And I wasn't mad at anybody, but just talking here, being a pastor, I'm not a pastor anymore, but I was for many decades. You know, the same people in the prayer line for the same thing for 20 years. Right. Come on. And I finally realized something's wrong and it's not me and it's not God. Right. Hello. I've taught people how to be healed, you know, for almost 40 years. And I realized they must not be getting to the root of the problem. 
and keep ending up, you know, and we're not, we're not against ministry. I'm going to minister tonight to you. That's not what I'm teaching, but I'm asking you a question that Jesus said to the man, will you be made whole? Not will you just be healed, but will you be made whole? Are you really going to put the ax to the root of the thing that keeps you sick all the time? So I taught two, two sessions on that that I kept anyway. I may have taught more, but wilt thou be made whole? It's not just a question of getting healed all the time. What is it that disturbs me where I'm out of my, you know, peace? Right. You know, when Jesus healed the woman with the issue of blood, he said, go in peace. So you got to learn to walk in peace once you get your healing, or guess what? You'll be right back in it. In the sickness or the disease or maybe a multitude of that. And then there's a spirit of infirmity that causes people to be sick. I call it, it bounces around in your body. We may pray for people like that tonight. You know, one time you have ear aches and you have throat problems and you have bowel problems and you have teeth problems uh -huh. and you have joint problems and you have, just on and on and on and on. Right. I call it the story of woe that never ends. Come on. Yes, sir. And I'm not being smart aleck. It's no fun to be sick. No. But some people live their whole life in drama and crises. Hello. God didn't create you to live in crisis Hello. or drama. That's right. But you have to pay attention if you don't want that because most of the crowd's going moving that way. Yes, well, let me just tell you what they said. Let me tell you what they did. It don't matter what they did, honey. Unless you forgive them, you're going to you're gonna reap the consequences of your bitterness. Yeah. And you don't you want that. Right yes, sir. When God says woe unto thee, you don't want that on your name. Right. Woe. No, you don't. <laughs> Here's a little healing testimony or deliverance testimony. If you get healed or get delivered in my meetings, and many do, I don't think I get even 20% of the people that get that send me any notification. But this helps me, and I file this mm -hmm. if you want to fill this out. If you've been healed, and you know, I'm not just because you get in a prayer line tonight, don't run out to my book table and fill this out, but take one home with you. Go back to your doctor. Yeah. Yeah. I encourage people to go back to their doctor. Yes, sir. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And if you really get it, then write me and tell me about it. Praise God. I'd like to know about it and rejoice with you. Amen. I'm not the healer, but he lives in me. <laughs> Amen. Okay, I got a healing ministry, so right. it's pretty evident if you paid attention. But anyway, just talking to you. Then this, I'm going to talk to you tonight about this. Angels on earth, they're waiting on you. Amen. It's kind of a pun on words. They're waiting on you like a good waiter or waitress waits at your table. They don't bug the two watt out of you, <laughs> but they're there often enough to fill your glass and can I get you something else? You need anything? I know. Oh, I didn't bring you silverware. Let me. You know they're helpful. Amen. So, but this is kind of like they're waiting on you. Amen. They have arms too, but they have wings and stuff. Some of them, and they're waiting on you. They're waiting on you to say something they could do to help you. So anyway, I, I just I'm thrilled. This was written 18 years ago. I can't believe it. I wrote it that long ago. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I want to read something here if I can find it. This is from my uh, introduction. Uh, in these last days, things are changing quickly. God is elevating his church, his ministers, and his people to a place we've never known before. It's time for signs, wonders, healings, and demonstrations. Both the Old and the New Covenants indicate that signs and wonders come, at least in part, through the ministry of angels. Jesus needed and valued their help, and so do we. And if you don't think you do, you're just not thinking very intelligently, scripturally. I pray this book will cause faith to come to your hearts concerning the angels assigned to you and your ministries. We've just had a lot to do with them over the years. They've had a lot to do with me. And we'll talk a little bit maybe about maybe one of the visions we've had. We see here what we get into tonight. But in my ministry particularly, <clears throat> I didn't ask for it just to help you. You know, I didn't ask for any of this. I just was a drug addict and a drug dealer. And finally, after I'd lost 80 pounds shooting speed and carrying a gun and becoming a drug dealer and a drug addict, I realized this isn't working. <laughs> and lost 80 pounds shooting speed. And I was just a mess. My mind was a mess. My mind was really a mess. My brain, my, my memory was gone. I couldn't remember things from, you know, an hour before or a day before. 
and uh, I came to church. I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I'd been in church as a kid, but never made really connected right, and just went out in the world, you know, and got more and more involved in drugs. And people said, "I guess you gave up drugs because you got saved." I gave up drugs because it was killing me. <laughs> What's wrong with you people, brother? I like drugs. That's why I was a drug addict. But it was killing me. And I realized that after three years of being a drug addict, I am dying. And if I don't do something, I don't know what I'm going to do. I did die once when, as a drug addict. I had overdosed and left my body and came out of my body. And God put me back in my body. Anyway, that's all, that's all free. <laughs> yeah, I want to talk to you a little bit. Let's, let's see. Let's start over here in uh, the book of Hebrews. Oh, hallelujah for Hebrews. I did up a little Hebrews this afternoon. <laughs> Lined it up. Oh, wow. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, Hebrews, what a great book in the Bible. It's, a, it's one of the more complicated books. I didn't understand it for years, and then I started seeing it, and things started fitting for me. But and the reason I want to talk to you about this, I had planned to teach something different tonight. But as usual, I, he doesn't work for me. I work for him. <laughs> and when he says, this isn't the right message, I need you to think different. So I just said, okay. I sat back and was praying at the hotel. And he said, I want you to talk about the angels that help you in your healing ministry and tell the people some of the things. I can't tell everything. I don't have time that the angels have done with me in cooperation with me to heal people. Amen. <laughs> Yeah, I was in uh, Manzanillo, Mexico. Uh, let me see, how long ago was that? I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. And I had a word of knowledge about heart problems, cardiac problems, not your spiritual heart, but your pumper. And I asked people to come. There was about eight people lined up. And when I, got, I came to the first guy, I laid hands on his head, and an angel came from around the back side of me. He stuck his hand in that man's chest about up to there. And it, what it looked like to me in the spirit, like he's opening a safe. He was his fingers. He would do stuff like this. Well, I had my hand on the guy's head. I saw it. I was looking right at it, his hand in his guy's chest. He didn't even have to have surgery. He just stuck it right in, and he went like that. And when I took my hand off his head, he pulled his arm out. The next one was a lady. He did the same thing. It was eight or seven or eight people. Every one of them, when I laid hands on their head, he stuck his hand in their chest. And started doing, and what he was doing, he was correcting things. Mm -hmm. wow. But it just looked like kind of like a guy opening a safe. <laughs> okay, I'm not trying to play it down. I'm just telling you how it looked to me. And so <laughs> when I got done preaching and ministering, the lady, the second one in line, she ran to me. Did you see the angel put his hand in my chest? She's talking so fast. I said, <laughs> did you see an angel put his hand in your chest? I played it stupid, you know, like, like dumb, dumb yeah. to see if she really saw it. Yes, I did, she said. And I said, I did too. What happened? Well, when he got done, whatever he did to adjust things, all the symptoms left me. Praise God. I said, he was fixing you. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. And we've had this over many, many, many years. I didn't learn this all in one day or one decade. I started studying this in 1980. That's 40 years ago. Never got preached what I know yet, much less what God knows about this subject. When I had my book, I sent some uh, CDs away, or they might have been cassettes. I don't know how far back, 2002. But anyway, I had a 517-page manuscript. And the Lord started laughing at me. Michael, 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 he said. You're not going to be able to teach all that in this side of heaven. You, you, and this is what he said to me. I'm just being honest. He said, I want you to reduce it down to about 100 pages and write it so a third grader could understand it. Do you understand me? Yes, sir. So that's what I did. It's about 101 or two pages, and a third grader could read my book. Amen. Yeah. I got a little granddaughter. She's seven now, I think. This is about a year or two back. She called, uh, she called and Grandma answered, and she said, I want to talk to Papa. So I said, hey, honey, what's up? She said, well, Mommy tells me that you see angels. And I said, yes. And she said, I want to know how I can see an angel. That's coming from the mouth of a seven-year-old, my granddaughter. I said, well, you know, I can't tell you how to do that, honey. That's going to have to be on God's side of it to allow you to see into that other world. There's another world. 
I talked to her just like I'd talk to Dr. Cody if he asked me that. Yes, sir. And I said, but I can't give you permission to see into that world. It has to operate through God, uh -huh. through you to see. But now, <laughs> so uh, she, uh, she said uh, she went to school. I guess it was the kindergarten. And she told the teacher, <laughs> my papa's the angel man. <laughs> And he sees angels. Oh, okay. And we all said, what did your teacher say? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> I, mean, I thought so. Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> Particular denominational school she went to, but most of them like that would have nothing to say either because they don't know any better. They don't know how to respond to something like that. But so finally I said to her on the phone that night, I said, Wani, Tell me why you want to know about this subject. What got you interested? Well, I want to pray for my friends, and I want to pray that they be kept safe. I said, well, honey, you can just do it like this. Father, and I named some of her little girlfriends that she has. I said, pray for so-and-so and so-and-so, and, -so, and I pray for them to be protected today by the angels that are assigned to them. Amen. All you got to do is say that, honey. That's right. Okay. <laughs> She was happy. She said, now you have a book. Mommy said, you had a book on that. I said, I sure do. She said, I want one. I said, okay. And next time I saw her, I didn't have one in my back pocket. She said, where's my book? I said, hop in the truck. And we <laughs> went up to church and got an angel book. Of course, she couldn't read, but Mommy's been reading it to her. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. I mean, most of us were 35 if we ever knew anything about angels. And some are 50 and don't, still don't know nothing about them. Just because you know they exist, that don't help you. Right. <laughs> you got to know how to activate them. Yeah. And mainly through your words that are spoken based on this word. You know, there's about 300 references in the Bible to angels. 300. I teach a lot of subjects. I don't teach as much as I used to as far as broadening subjects because I'm more honed in to doing. Really, I like my, <laughs> how do I say this, Father? I'm getting drunk in the Holy Ghost if you're listening by tape. Not drinking it. I'm drinking at Joel's place, but anyway. <laughs> what was I saying? 300 references. Three, most of the subjects I taught, even as a pastor, which teach everything because people don't know anything when they first come. They act like they know it all, but they don't. And you had to teach everything to people, marriage and how to handle your money and yeah. how to raise your kids and how to, you know, not want to strangle one another at home and, yes, sir. you know, whatever. I'm just talking. There's no people. And just everything about you have teach, but so 300 references, that's a massive amount. Yeah. I don't know many subjects that any preacher preaches that has that many references. There's probably money has more than that. I'm sure it does. Uh, but uh, anyway, are you listening? Yeah. And a uh, uh, th hundred of the 300 is when they appeared to a man or a woman or sometimes a couple and had a conversation of some, di some dimension. Wow. You know, we just sang that song. <laughs> It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. I always go back to 2 Kings 6, where the prophet was, uh, you know, over in Dothan, not Alabama. Dothan in Israel. <coughs> Just to clarify for some of the southerners. Okay, he wasn't in Dothan, Alabama. But, uh, and then, the, you know, this is the way, you know, it's kind of a funny story when you think about it. You know, people that are heathens, they don't think very good. You know, the general that opposed Israel got all of his leaders together, all his lieutenants and captains, and said, I want you to tell me which one of you is betraying me. Who's going to raise their hand? Yeah. What's the matter with you? Who's going to say, it's me? You're going to slap your head right off your shoulders, buddy. No, and they, but they said, it's that, it's that prophet over there in Dothan that knows everything that you do, even in your bedchamber. That's right. <laughs> He said, well, you go over there to Dothan and you surround that city at night. That's the way cowards work in the dark. And you surround that city and his ministry of helps, Elisha, that prophet, who was the protege of Elijah, he went out. You know, he had his Evie on water and his headband, his <laughs> Nike shoes, went out jogging around the city and came back and said, boss, they got us surrounded. What are we going to do? He said, oh, Lord, open his eyes. Well, that's what the problem was, what he saw with his eyes. They had the whole, it was down in a bowl, right. like some cities I've been in in the earth, Mexico City's like that, Tegucigalpa and Honduras is like that. It's down in the, uh -huh. and said, God, they're all on the, got us surrounded. There's no way out. And he said, oh, Lord, open his eyes. 
but he didn't open his natural eyes, opened his spiritual eyes. And what was really the reality, the angels had their chariots of fire on that city behind the enemy. <laughs> it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Yeah. That's what I think of when I'm singing that. Angel man, you know, it's, it's typical. Me. Think like that. That's good thinking. That's good thinking. And then, you know, they came down into the city and Elisha went out and said, hey, I can take you to find this guy. Come with me. But he smote them all with blindness first. So he takes the whole opposing army to Israel, right downtown, where all the soldiers got their weapons pulled. And he said, okay, Lord, open their eyes. And you know, the Bible says what they did. They left humiliated and they never bothered Israel again in Elisha's lifetime. On. Just one time like that would make slop, slop something out of you. Yeah. What's the matter with you? Yeah. Just one prophet took the whole army with God's help. I don't know why I told that. That's because that song reminds me when I sing it. So sometimes you may feel like you're surrounded, but just remember if you're a person who understands the angels, they are surrounding you. <coughs> Yeah, let's look here at Hebrews 1, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Are they not all ministering spirits? I like to say it this way, they all have ministries. I don't know why I thought this way. Probably somebody sent my mother a card in the denominational church we grew up in at some special event, <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, it's coming up in April. And they had, you know, <laughs> had angel-looking creatures eating grapes and picking guitars. I don't know that any of them pick guitars personally. They do sing. I don't, I'm not sure about instruments, but anyway. Amen. See, you get a lot of funny ideas because of what you've been presented with all your life, right. never really understanding the fullness. That's right. yeah. Now, you don't have to go home, ladies, and throw all your figurines in the trash that looked like a little baby, a preschooler with long curly hair and a beer belly. <laughs> but if that's what you think your angel looks like, you'd be good just to forget it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not decent. They are masculine. They are mighty. They are intimidating. <laughs> How intimidating are they? I'm glad you asked that. How about Matthew 28 when they went to the tomb of Jesus? And you know, some people came to the uh, mayor of Jerusalem and said, they're going to go over there and steal his body is what's going to happen, and you're going to lose your position. And he said, he called over to the army, you put your toughest guys on it, put, put the rangers on there, put SWAT on there. That's right. Put, you know, Delta Force. <laughs> Don't put no, these, so these were battle, battle people. These were people that had been in battle with swords and killed people and, and all kinds of stuff of warfare. They were tough guys. They weren't a bunch of cowards and weenies. Right. Yeah. And when that angel showed up, it said they shook for fear and fainted. Yeah. <laughs> Fell out. Yeah. Think about that. One angel came and appeared to them and they fainted for fear. Yeah. These are tough guys. Yeah. You know, I used to live with some bikers, you know, Hell's Angels type of guys. They're bad motor scooters. I thought I was tough till I met them. Oh, my God. I won't tell you everything. We'll just get back on angels here. But yeah, so angels are masculine. They are strong. They're mighty. They know how to defend you. I don't know where I'm trying to get into this a little bit. And let's read verse 14 again. Are they not all ministering spirits? Now, you know, in the body of Christ, we have the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. And then we have the ministry of helps which is separate, but yet important, equally important to the body of Christ. So what I'm saying is everybody should have a job. Everybody should have a function. Maybe put it that way. In the body, and he says here, are they not all ministering spirits? They all have different ministries. Some of the angels work with me, they only do one thing. I got one that works with me, he's got like, a, he, they have hands and eyes and ears and all that. But he's got a hand but he's got in this finger right here, he's got a, a laser looking light that comes out of it. That's all I can tell you about him. Other than this is what he does, he does lungs. And he'll put his finger up on somebody's chest and start doing this back and forth. 
and when he gets through, it looks normal. When he started, it looks miscolored, off-colored, sometimes gray, a few times black, which means you're going to die if it doesn't get changed. You know, you can't have black lungs. And he, when he gets through with them, they look normal. <laughs> I was in Costa Rica a few years ago. I just feel like talking to you tonight about this, and then we're going to minister to some people. But I was in Costa Rica, and I was <laughs> teaching about angels. Dennis was with me, Pastor Dr. Hattaball was with me, and he was there in this meeting, and an elderly lady came for her lungs. Now, this is the first time I saw this angel appear to me with a finger. And as the lady, for, so, I mean, I was, I was probably 55 then. She was probably 70 or 75, elderly lady. And she said to me, I've had lung problems all my life. And, I, and when I started to minister, I said, hey, there's an angel working on your lungs. And I saw him. He went like that. Then he went like that, and she fell out. Amen. Now, the guy that invited me to come to the country, Costa Rica, he had a grandson. I didn't know him, but he was standing to the side. And he got in line, but I want, I'm not making fun, but this is the way he would breathe. He's about 10 years old. <laughs> Constantly. He got in my prayer line for lungs. I said, that angel's working on you, son. Of course, I got an interpreter. <laughs> and they told me that night they came back, they went home and had lunch. Let's call him Jose. That's a good Latin name. He's standing over to the side. They're all eating lunch, and he's going, <laughs> His mom said, Jose, what are you doing? He said, Mom, I'm breathing. I'm breathing. <laughs> yeah, hallelujah. I had that same angel give somebody a new lung one time, put a new lung in her chest. She went back to the same guy that took out part of it and said, well, you got a new lung. What happened? Of course, I don't think he said much after she said, I went to church and the man of God prayed for me. And she was the only one in that prayer line that I prayed for for lungs that I tapped her on her foot when she was, you know, laying down. I tapped her and I said, God's given you a new lung. And then I went on. I forgot I even said it to her. And Pastor Johnny Simons, who's her pastor, <laughs> called me a couple weeks later and said, do you remember that lady you said God's given? I said, no, did I say that? He said, you sure did. But she was the only one in the whole prayer line you said that to. She just had surgery, had part of her lung removed for cancer. Two-thirds of one lung. And she went back to the doctor uh, four or five weeks after she'd gotten out, <laughs> got, the doctor checked her and said, well, you got a new lung. What happened? Amen. Yeah. They, see, heaven's got parts. Yes. Yeah, I had a lady get a new heart, too. I got the readout from the medical profession. In fact, the guy took it. He took, you know, when they have those light-up things, they stick it. He sticked it up like that, and her name was Joyce. She said, Joyce, this is your heart you had. Last time I saw you, this is the heart you have now. You can tell this is not that heart, but you have a new heart. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> yeah. We had a lot of things happen with angels. We had a lady in my church, her and her husband, they were in there. I just feel like telling stories. <laughs> We'll get into the word a little bit. Are they not all ministering spirits? This is what we're talking about. They all have a ministry. You know, all of us, we don't do everything. If you did, you don't do anything real good. You just do a little bit of everything. But typically what I'm saying is if you're smart, you figure out where your calling is and become more skillful in whatever it is you do do for God. These angels are very specific. Some of them do a multitude of things. They have two angels work with me. They repair and restore people's bodies when I'm in the spirit. And they minister to people on a lot of frontiers, a lot of different areas. But that one with the finger, he don't do feet. He just does lungs. He don't do brains. He just does lungs. He don't do hearts. He just does lungs. Yes. Amen. Some of them do multitude things too. Just How do you know that? Well, I've walked with God a long time telling you about this lady. This lady, her name was Patty, married to Jerry. They were about 40. I don't know if they married late in life anymore, but they were probably 35 when they got married, probably 40 when they came to my church a little over and said, we'd like to come see you. I said, sure. So they made an appointment, came in, sat down in my office and said, we want to have our own baby. I said, well, <laughs> okay. They said, no, you don't understand. He went to the doctor and said, he's all messed up. I went to the female doctor and she said, I'm all messed up. I said, you two are you're never going to be able to have a baby in your condition. 
I said, well, you thought about adoption? Yeah, but we'd like to have our own baby. I said, okay. I laid hands on their head and sent them on their way. They kept trying month after month after I saw them. Nothing happened. One Sunday I had a prayer meeting, a, prayer meeting, a word of knowledge, and it was on a Sunday morning. I think it was for depression. I don't remember exactly. And this Patty, she came over here, this part of the altar area, and I barely touched her head, and within half a second she was 13, 15 feet away from me. And people in the meeting could have saw it if they looked. And she went backwards. I don't know. It seemed like she just slid backwards to me. I never saw her feet move, but she was standing here when I laid hands on her. And like one second later, she was back in this aisle right here, about this far from me. Still had her hands up. She didn't trip. She didn't fall. I never saw her feet move. Just some signs and wonders. <laughs> you know. What did I just read you out of my book? At least in part, signs and wonders take place through the angels. All of a sudden, this angel appeared to her on this side of her body, be the left. He stuck her hand. He stuck his hand down in her insides down there. I didn't see anything vulgar, too, just to help you. And he started doing something. And I said, Patty, the angel's fixing something down there. Next month, she was pregnant. <laughs> mm -hmm. They know how to fix things. Yeah. And I think that child probably today is a man, a boy. He was a boy, had a boy. He's probably maybe 20 years old now. Hallelujah. All right. Let's read this again. There's more juice in this verse. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Now, the Weymouth translation translates this verse. He was a Greek scholar. Uh, it says the angels are a benefit. To us, how many know benefits are important? Amen. And he says they're a benefit, which means this is what benefit means: a useful aid and a help. You know, even if you have a third grade education, you went to get a job somewhere, and you go to human resources, which is the people who usually interview you before they say okay or no, you were not well, <laughs> you were not interested. You would ask them, well, how many hours do I have to work a week, and what shift am I on? How much time do I get for lunch? Uh, you know, what do I have to do? You know, is there vacation time? Do I get anything special for pay if I work overtime? Is there overtime pay, double time? What about the weekends? Do I get that off? What about a dental program? What about eye care? I mean, just on and on and on. Even if you're just third grade educated, you want to know, unless you're just mentally ill, you want to know exactly what the benefits are if you're going to work for that company. That's and that's just normal. That's, right. that's not like you're being beggarly. You just find it out. This company provides this or this or that because you're interested. That's right. yes, sir. But here people, you know, we talk about angels and sometimes I don't think we realize the full context here, how beneficial they are to us and how they would like to help us. Amen. Now you got two, thank you for the scriptures, you got two PowerPoint things. I kind of look about this, when you get to heaven, God would say to me now, he probably just called me brother. Brother, uh, angel, so-and-so, run that tape on Brother Jacob. And he runs that tape, and it's like two and a half minutes long. And then he said, if you'd have paid attention and got the help I sent you, this is what could have happened. They run that tape, it's 27 minutes long. And then I'm crying because I'm in heaven. That's the only reason I know I'd be crying in heaven, but because I didn't take advantage in the right way of what God had tried to benefit me in because I wasn't paying attention. Yes, sir. Yeah. I'm, you see, I'm called to do what I'm called to do, but I have assistance in this. And all of you here, you have personal angels assigned to you. There's a whole chapter in my book on personal angels. I mean, you can call them guardian if you want, but I like personal better, that term, but it's personal angels. And because I'm in the ministry, you just and I've accumulated them. Others came at different parts in my life in 43 years. They didn't all show up all at once. They're a benefit. And what does Psalm, remember, say with me in Hebrews, what does Psalm 103 said? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And before you get out of Psalm 103, about verse 19 and 20, his angels are mighty. That's right. Who adhere to the voice of his word. The word doesn't have a voice unless you put one on it. Amen. That's so good. They're not doing anything just because the Bible says so. You have to say it. That's right. Come on. 
and you have to say it. That's right. Brother Hagin said it this way. I don't think they appreciate Brother Hagin. I do too, but he said you're not getting anything just because you believe it. Right. You have to say it. You have to say it right. to release it. So good. <laughs> okay. Find those scriptures that say things. Now, the Amplified Bible of verse 14, there's still more in verse 14, says this. says that the angels are an assistance to us. See, they're an assistance. Now, I have a staff kind of indirectly. Most of the people there I've hired, but my son pastors the church today, so some of them work for me and my, my son, who's the pastor. But, you know, Dale's been with me 40 years, and, and a lot of times he's not full-time now. He's kind of semi-retired. But nonetheless, I would say now, you know, I like shredders. <laughs> Have I told this before here? Yeah, that's a good story, isn't it? I like shredders. Bzz, bzz, bzz. <laughs> you know, I've read 100 books on angels in my lifetime, 97 of them. Bzz, 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 bzz. Why? Because there was nothing in them. Yeah. A bunch of fluff, a pretty cover, and nothing you could live on. Yeah. Nothing that helped you whatsoever. Wow. Bzz, bzz. I kept three. One of them's mine. That I'll tell you what I think about it. <laughs> There's two others that I recommend, but anyway. So, Dale is my go-to guy. I said, Dale, I need a new shredder. I burnt that one up. <laughs> now bring me a bigger one. Not big enough to do a, a piano, but... <laughs> And he went down to Office Max, Office Depot, and he had a credit card from the church and went and bought me a shredder, brought it to my garage, took it out of the box, set it on the floor, and put a note, here you go, Dad. Yeah. Here you go, Doctor. Yes, and I just brought it in the house, plugged it in. Bzz, bzz. I had to try it out. Bzz, bzz. <laughs> All my books in my library are shaking. They feel like if I find any unbelief, <laughs> you know, I'm putting you in the shredder. Bzz, that's where you belong. Bzz, in the trash. And all of them are Christian books, supposedly. Yeah. yeah. So my point was, I didn't have to do anything. I just called Dale and said, Dale, would you go get me a new shredder? So you got angels work for you, work for me. And I say, I need you to help to do this or that. And they just take off and go do that. <laughs> I think it's kind of interesting all these years. None of them have ever talked back. You know, people talk back, but they don't. Right. I mean, and I don't make up stuff, and I'm not goofy. And so, you know, tell them to do things that the Bible doesn't say. Right. And they would definitely either rebuke me or they just wouldn't do it. Right. They're only doing what the Word says. Come on. Right. But they're an assistance to us. And think how much what you could do with some assistance in your life. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Praise the Lord. Yes, Are you still here with me? Let's read it one more time. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Well, this is the way I think about it. If they would do that for me to help me become an heir of salvation, how much more would they work for me as a son and daughter of God? This is God and sons. When I say sons, I don't mean just male. I explained that this morning. So it's God and children. How much more would God take care of us as his sons and daughters? We're, not, we're servants by our own will to serve God, that's true. But in the reality of Scripture, I'm not a servant, I'm a son. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. You know. And my son had friends over to spend the night, you know, when he was a teenager, and they got in our refrigerator and ate and all that. But, you know, sometimes I just said, they got to go. Time for them to go home. <laughs> They're not my son. I didn't dislike them, but, you know, they didn't live with me. Okay. So I like to read this this way. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those of us who are the heirs of salvation? It's 2,000 years after this was written. How many are heirs of salvation tonight? Well, then you got angels wanting to help you and be an assistance to you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's go over here to Colossians chapter 1. Let me find something over here a minute. Colossians 1. Man, time getting away from me. Colossians 1, 16. It says, For by him or by Jesus or by the word were all things created. You could translate this, were all beings created. 
that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. So there's some invisible beings in the planet. They're not unreal. They're just unseen to the natural eye. How many know what I'm saying? Listen, this is important. I don't have to see anything. In fact, I, you know, again, I mean, I'm just being honest. I didn't ask to see anything in this. And I started seeing things and I would alarm me. I want to tell you of a vision that meant it totally set me back. I didn't very say anything to anybody for months about it because I was so freaked out. But see, there are beings in the earth, and this is not something you're warring against. Listen to me here. This is not Ephesians 6 passage. This is Colossians 1 passage. What is a principality in this particular context? It's a prince over a municipality. It's not an evil one either. It doesn't say that. We're not fighting against evil. There was some in Ephesians that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of darkness, etc. Evil spirits in wicked places. But this is not saying we're fighting them. It just gives some designations of things. Yeah. Are you listening? I had a good friend. He's a pastor. His name was uh, uh, Pastor Silva. He was from Deming, New Mexico. I'd preach for him, and he knew I knew something about angels. And we were at a Dr. Dufresne meeting at uh, Pastor Everly's one time, staying at the same hotel, and I was eating breakfast by myself. He came in. Can I sit by you? Sure. Come on. And he said, I got a question to ask. Somebody said, you know something about angels. I said, I know something. Uh, what, what's your question? He said, well, I'm a mayor of a city and a pastor. And I've got these two angels that help me in my mayoral office, but they don't ever help me at church. You got an explanation? I said, off the cuff, I just say this. They're not called to help you at church. They're called to help you in your civil government. Yes, sir. But I'm going to get you chapter and verse. I'll call you in a week. I went home. God gave me this verse in Colossians. See, a principality was, if you have a godly leader... He has, <laughs> he has uh, spirit beings, angelic beings that help him in his governmental decisions. Amen. Whether he's a governor or mayor or, you know, whatever he might be or she. Yeah, that's right. wow. mm -hmm. If you have an ungodly leader, then you get help from the other world. Uh -oh. yeah. The demonic world. And usually they make strongholds in those cities. Yeah. You know, evil stuff. Yeah. All right. So these beings, I lost my place here. I think fan kicked on. That's all right. I like it. But it says there are beings in heaven and in earth, visible and invisible. I want to get that into you. Just because you can't see something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. <laughs> I mean, most people, you know, I don't, I'm not a particular weather person, but other people I know are. And they listen to the weather and they say, it's going to rain. You got your umbrella out for the morning and you haven't seen a drop. <laughs> You're not going to tell me you have more faith in a weather guy than you do Jesus, are you? Please don't tell me that. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you haven't seen anything yet. Now, it might rain, it might not rain, but he said it was going to, so you prepare for it. But you haven't felt anything, seen anything yet. Right. But this is telling us these beings are unseen but not unreal. Amen. That's good. We would say they're behind the scenes, maybe. I don't know if that's... But see, you would have to either have uh, visions, like I have, I don't have many dreams. I have visions and I operate in discerning of spirits. You'd have to either have a vision, a dream, or discerning of spirits to see into that other world. And just for your information, no, I'm not walking around seeing things every day. I wouldn't want to have to deal with that in my brain. But there are times I do see things that I need to address or deal with in people or maybe over a certain area to pray about and things like that. And the only reason he'd show it to me is because I need to do something about it. Yes, sir. That's right. All right. All right. Praise God. So, but if you didn't have one of those operations, you don't have dreams or visions that are God ordained, or you don't operate in discerning of spirits. And it's not discerning of evil spirits, it's discerning of spirits. So that would mean the other world. Sometimes you might see angels, you might see devils, or you might even, a few times I've seen into somebody. And saw something in there that wasn't right. And I said, Jesus' name, come out. Yeah. <laughs> and that thing leaves them. Yeah. Come on. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Where am I going here tonight? I'm trying to get this taught. I'm trying to do my best here. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father. I had a lady in my church 
I won't mention her name because these tapes go everywhere, and I really didn't know why I was calling her up to pray for her. And I, so-and-so come up here, and I prayed for her. And she lifted her hands. I laid hands on her and prayed over her. I don't even remember what I prayed. And I walked down this way, ministered to some other people. The Lord said, turn around. I turned around, and out of her belly, this, this angel was standing here. He's pulling something out of her belly. Didn't look very nice. It looked like trash. That's all I can tell you. It wasn't down in the female area. It wasn't up in her chest. It was in her stomach. And I, I knew by the Spirit when I looked, and that angel's pulling stuff out of her. Well, I, you know, people are already confused enough. I don't want to confuse them more. I certainly wasn't going to tell her that at that moment. But I went home that night and told my wife and my daughter. My daughter was single, living at home then. And she said, well, Dad, didn't you know she struggles with anorexia and bulimia? I said, no, I didn't know that. <laughs> That's what that was. That angel was getting her delivered from that. Praise God. And so my daughter started crying, and I called the lady up, and I said, this Pastor Jacobs, I want to tell you what I saw tonight. I told her what I just told you. She started crying. She's been delivered ever since. She's in her 40s now. She was about 20 years old, maybe 19, when that occurred. You know, the devil makes And she was just a normally, a normal lady, normally built lady. <laughs> Let me say that. And the devil told her she had to wear a size two or something ridiculous. I don't know what it was. I don't know about dress sizes. But he had her convinced she was too big and she wasn't big at all. Kind of on the slender side. But he made her feel like she was huge. See, the devil works on people. But see, she got delivered. So the angel who helped me, assisted me in that particular deliverance. I'm just telling you what I saw. Are you listening to me? Yeah. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> I'm going to tell this testimony. This happened just a little bit ago, about a month ago. I looked it up on my calendar. I was down in Tennessee, and uh, this gentleman doesn't go to the church I was preaching at, but he came to hear me. And uh, I went to preach for his pastor the, the, the day after I finished the meeting with another pastor in the same city. That's rare. I don't do that typically. But the pastor that's a son to me, he asked this pastor would he like to have me for a service and he agreed i knew the pastor he'd met me he'd been in my meetings with the pastor that is my son and he got an impartation from me and he knew a little bit about me but said that then when i went to his church on wednesday night this happened the night before this young man uh let me just tell you he said to me he i came in i was putting the mic on and he said benjamin tell dr jacobs what happened to you he said well when i was he's about 23 year old boy now young man Rather, he said, when I was a baby, I had tumors or cysts on my kidneys. They had to cut them out. Then I got a little bigger. They were on my back. And then when I got in high school, he says, really embarrassing. I hate to tell you this, but I had them on my rear end. A bunch of these tumors or cysts, and I'm, I'm going to be graphic because he was with me. They filled up with pus and blood, and they burst, and they really stunk. And he said, I was such an embarrassed young man. And he said, they, I had to get those cut off my backside. And in the meeting I was in the night before, I'd had some words of knowledge. I said, you're bleeding. <laughs> I said, to, and he had his facing surgery again. They all came back on his rear end. I said, you're bleeding. You're bleeding on your backside. I don't understand what I was seeing there. I said, you're not bleeding out of some yeah. orifice, but you're. You're bleeding on your backside. <laughs> that was him. I didn't know. I had my eyes closed. I said, if I call out something that you get up here. So he, Benjamin's telling me this testimony. He said, when they told me you were coming, Dr. Jacobs, I began to believe God. I said, when Dr. Jacobs comes and lays hands on me, I'll be healed. Amen. I laid hands on him that night in my meeting on Tuesday night. This is the next night. He stood there and said, they're all disappeared. When I woke Praise up, swore, they're all gone. <laughs> I won't have to have the surgery. Hey, isn't that marvelous? Where did they go? Don't worry about it. It'd be all right. <laughs> he, he didn't ask me that. Some people asked me. Some lady I had, had a tumor in her throat and it dissolved and left. Where'd you think it went? I said, don't worry about it. It's gone. <laughs> Some people just want to worry about something. I said, death swallowed it up. Life swallowed it up. Just dissipated it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, I'll tell you just a couple more things here, and then I'm going to pray for you. I was in Virginia doing a meeting with uh, several other preachers, 
And uh, we, I came a day early before. I, no, I think I came the day I was going to speak, but I got there the night before and went to the luncheon that day, and they had a different speaker. And we were all sitting at a table in the back, the speakers, there's five or six of us. He came off the platform, did a great job. His name's Jerry McGee. And he came back and said, hey, I'm Jerry McGee. And I said, hey, I'm Dr. Jacobs. Hey, you know, I got problems with my spine. Now, I don't know if somebody told him that I had success in spines or not. So my response to him was, well, I'm preaching tonight. Are you coming to the service? Yep. Yeah. I said, well, it won't be a word of knowledge. I'm not going to pretend it was to him. <laughs> but I'll just say, Jerry, I'm going to minister to you when the anointing's on me. I'll preach for a while, and then the anointing will come, and I'll, I'll come minister to you. And then God will straighten your spine up. So now I look him back there. He's about halfway back in the service, not up on the front two rows. He's one of the speakers. If he brought his Bible, I didn't see it. And when I looked at him, he looked angry. I thought, man, I must be plowing his field sideways. You know what that means? Like saying stuff that he don't agree with or doesn't like or whatever. I mean, and the longer he sat there, the more he, he just seemed really intense. And so I said, okay, Jerry, come on, stand out. He stood out in the middle aisle, and I laid hands on him. Then I stepped back. Up. I said, there's that anointing for your spine. About that time, an angel came from around my right hip like this. He stuck his finger down here, the lower part of his abdomen. He started rolling something. I said, Jerry, that angel's rolling something. He turned around and ran straight out of the meeting. I said, man, I have ticked this guy off. That's all I could think of. He didn't say goodbye. He right. just turned around. I'm in a Marriott hotel. He runs out the back of the building. I don't know if he's going to go home. He's going to go up the stairs to his room, or he's just had it with me, or what. Right, right. So I just went on ministering by the Holy Ghost, and a few minutes later he comes back in. He's like this. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, his eyes are beaming. I said, Jerry, what happened to you? He said, I guess you noticed I didn't look very happy. I said, yeah, it dawned on me. You didn't look very happy at all. He said, the thing you didn't know is I had a kidney stone, and I hadn't been able to use the restroom for three days. And the longer I sat there, the more intense that pain became. And said, when you said that angel's moving something, I could feel something moving inside of me. And I went out to the men's room, and the stone came out when I used the body. <laughs> And I'm pain free. Hey! You hey, didn't know angels could move kidney stones, did you? A lot of things they do. A whole lot of things they do. It's just amazing. Just amazing. Now, I want to read you something here before we begin to minister to you. Uh, first of all, I want to read, I'm, I'm going, you don't have to go back to Hebrews 1.14, but this is from the Jubilee Bible. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth in service for the love of those who are the heirs of saving health? See, so here we have a translation. It's called the Jubilee Bible 2000. I'm assuming that's the year it was published. I don't know. Uh, somebody gave me this, one of my staff members. I said, get on the computer and find me some other references to Hebrews 1.14. And says, it says, they are, not, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth in service for the love of those who are the heirs of saving health? See, the angels want to help us be healthy. That's what I'm trying to say to you. Now, this is a, um, a prophecy from Brother Hagen from 1988. It's quite a bit ways back. He had a vision. He saw, I think there's three different angels mentioned here. We're just interested in the one. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let, me, let me find my passage. There will arise an army. There will arise an army. And he said that four or five times. And he said, for these are the beginning of those days, the beginning of the last days, and, and we will walk in the Spirit, men and women equipped with the power of the Holy Ghost. Then he says, they'll learn to walk in the Spirit. They'll learn to join forces with the forces of heaven. And the angels will come and minister unto them. And the angels will come and minister with them. And I told you about the heart people down in Manzanillo, Mexico. I told you about the lady that had bulimia. Yeah. told you about the guy that had a kidney stone. Yeah. I could tell you many, many more if I had time that have been helped through our ministry. We had a lady in uh, Honduras, uh, Miriam Cabrera, her and her husband. They took a liking to me first time I went. I went there for 10 or 12 years every year. And she, they owned a restaurant, and her husband was a chef. And they would have us over to their home at least one luncheon uh, when I brought my group down there. Well, I'd ministered to her the night before. I just gave a word of knowledge about spinal problems. 
and she got in the line. I don't know, it's been 40 people in that line. It's one of the hugest prayer lines I've seen for that issue. I got to her and I hit her in the head and I just went on and the next day I'm at her house. And she said, I want you to sit here, Dr. Jacobs and Pastor so-and-so, you sit there, I'm gonna sit here, I wanna tell you what happened. I said, Mary, I'm interested in know what happened to you. Well, I fell as a little girl and I cracked my tailbone. I never had surgery. And as I got older, it progressively got worse. I said, so I said, normally I wouldn't ask you this, but since I've known you for 10 years, I'm not a stranger to you. I've been in your home almost every year for 10 years. Would you mind telling me how old you are? When did the accident happen? I was six, I'm 41 now. Uh, so you, are you telling me you've had pain for 35 years? Yes, sir. What kind of pain was it? Intermittent, mediocre, intense, devastating. She said, it's just about devastating. I drive my kids to school, 10 minute drive. I have to stop, get out of the vehicle and walk around the van before I can finish taking them. It was so painful and I couldn't stand it for more than to sit like that for 20 minutes or something, it's just too much. And she said, you know, last night when you touched me, I didn't feel your hand, but I felt like electricity start here. It ran all the way down to this area that was affected and said, I felt a hand beneath the area that was bothering me and a hand above it that went, jerked it like that and all the pain left me. Now I have a missionary that still works in Honduras periodically. And she was down there the last five years. This happened 20 years ago or further back. And I said, if you run into Mary, I'm at how she's back, her spine's doing. She said, I saw her and she said, tell Dr. Jacobs I've never had another symptom since that night. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many know the angels want to work with us? Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. So I want you to come tonight. If uh, Stand up with me, please. If you have any kind of problems with your bones, any kind of bone issues, any spine, neck, joint problems, anything like that. We'll just get started here for a minute. Anybody come that needs help with your skeletal system. And if you have arthritis or bursitis or any of those things, then we, this is for you too. That The power of God will go into you when I lay hands on you. And if you'll let it work in you, your part is to say the power of God's working in me. That's your part to say the power of God's working in me. Like this man right here, the power of God's working in you, sir. In the yes, name of Jesus, be God's healed. I command yes, these bones to be healed by the power of the living God. In Jesus, every bit of arthritis come out in the name of Jesus. Power of God's working in you. I release that for your bone system, your skeletal system. In Jesus, release that in your bone system. Command that to leave you now in the name of Jesus. shall live and be strong in the name of Jesus. These bones shall live and be strong in the name of Jesus. I command any impairment to come out, any restriction to come out in Jesus' name, any arthritis to come out in the name of Jesus. Command your bones to be healed, sir, in the name of Jesus, from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. 
whatever it is that you need right now for that to come upon you and minister to you and help you, heal you, and deliver you from that, from the limitations you've had in the name of Jesus. New life to come to these bones. New life to come to every part of his anatomy. New life to come to his structure in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And I say be healed by the power of God. Be healed in your bones in the name of Jesus. I command everything to be healed in there in the bone structure of your body. Any arthritis to go, any impairments or restrictions to go, any limitations to go. I command you to be healed in your bones in the name of Jesus by the power of the living God. In Jesus' name, I release that anointing for bones. I release the anointing for bones, sir, to come into your body and minister to you, and make you whole and well in the name of Jesus. I command your bones to be healed in the name of Jesus. We release it to you now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> now your part's just after I pray for you in your, under your breath, say, Father, I believe I receive healing. Father, I release that anointing for these bones and wrecks to be healed in the name of Jesus. By the blood of the Lamb and in the name of I command every bone to be normal and right and whole in his skeletal system in the name of Jesus. Command your bones to be healed by the power of the living God. In Jesus' name. Every bit of weakness, come out. Every bit of arthritis, come out. Every bit of limitation, come out. In the name of Jesus, for all of these, command your bones to be healed by the power of the living God. Command your bones to be healed by the power of the living God. In Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Father. Command your bones to be healed by the power of the living God. In the name of Jesus. Well, that's it right there. Take that. Here it comes again. There it is again. Command your bones to be healed in the name of Jesus. There it is right there. The power's coming on you to heal your bones, to heal any limitations, to command limitations to go. Arthritis, come out in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Command these hips to be healed in Jesus' name. Command these bones to be healed by the power of the living God, Father, in the name of Jesus. We release it. We release it right now. There it is. Praise God. We release your power to go into her body, make her bones live again, make her bones flourish again in the name of Jesus. Make their bones all moist again, Father. I command these bones to live and be whole and be healed. I command these bones to be healed and to be whole and to receive new life from you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Command your bones to live and be strong in the name of Jesus. That's it right there. Command your bones to be healed and moistened and healed and any deposits of calcium to be burned up by the fire of God. Command your bones to be whole in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Anybody have any kind of teeth problem? I'd like you to come. Teeth or gums, a teeth or jaw, any kind of miracle like that with your teeth or your jaw. That I don't know what they call that hinge there. TMJ. Anything to do with your teeth, your jaw, your gums, your teeth. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are you in this line too? You're getting the whole nine yards tonight. <laughs> be, that's it. Be healed in your mouth, in your teeth and gums and jaw. Be healed in your teeth, your jaw and your gums in the name of Jesus. Be healed in your teeth, your jaw and your gums in the name of Jesus. Be healed in your teeth, your jaw and your gums in the name of Jesus. Be healed in that. Hallelujah. Be healed in your teeth, your gums, and your jaw, in Jesus' name. Be healed in your teeth, your gums, and your jaw, in Jesus' name. Be healed in your teeth, your jaw, and your gums. Be healed in your teeth, your jaw, and your gums. Be healed in your teeth, your jaw, and your gums, in the name of Jesus, by the power of the living God. Be healed in your teeth, your jaw, and your gum. Be healed in your teeth, your jaw, and your gums. In the name, be healed in your teeth, your jaw, and your gums. Be healed in your teeth, your jaw, and your gums. In the name of Jesus. That's it. Be healed in your teeth, your jaw, and your gums. Be healed in your teeth, your jaw, and your gums. 
in the name of Jesus. No more infections in any of these people. In the name of Jesus, be healed in your teeth, your jaw, and your gums. Be healed in your teeth, your jaw, and your gums. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Let's lift our hands a minute. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Praise God. Be healed in your teeth, your jaw, and your gums. In the name of Jesus. Straighten things out for them, Father. In their teeth, their jaw, and their gums. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Be healed in your teeth, your jaw, and your gums. In Jesus' name. Be healed in your teeth, your jaw, and your gums. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's lift our hands a minute. Father, thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Praise God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Anybody here, you need help in the area of your pancreas. What is that called? Diabetes? Yeah, does anybody need that in your life? A pancreas. Hallelujah. The Lord told me to start believing. Yeah, she's getting something. For new pancreases to come to people. Hallelujah. Give her a new pancreas, Father, in the name of Jesus. That's it right there. Take that. Give him a new pancreas, Father, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Give her a new pancreas, Father, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Give him a new pancreas in the name of Jesus, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Give her a new pancreas in the name of Jesus. By the power of the living God, Father, I thank you. You got parts. Thank you, Father, for straightening that out for her. Things are changing for all of these tonight that we're praying for. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, I started praying for pancreases maybe 10 years before that. I don't remember what year it was. I got it written in my Bible, maybe 2012. He said, I want you to start believing for new pancreases for people. And I have documentation from several people that got new pancreases. In fact, my son, Pastor Randy Parnell, he lives in Columbia, Kentucky. He went, you know, he had a little hiccup. His wife decided she didn't want to be in the ministry anymore. But he married a new gal, and she got in my prayer meeting just before she was married to him, and God healed of nine diseases in one service. She was dying. She was you know, yellow looking. She wrote me a 10 page document. She's a registered nurse, a really smart lady medically. She had a lot of issues in her body. Pancreatitis was one of them. And she had nine or 10, I forget now, what God straightened her out. She had a big tumor under her armpit. She didn't even ask for that. I said, I preached on miracles. I said, what did you come for? She said, I need a new esophagus, a stomach and intestines. She hadn't eaten any food down her mouth for two years. She had a food tube in her intestine down here. I didn't notice all that at the time. She just got in the prayer line, barely stumbled up to the, to the altar. She was just so frail looking. And I said, Father, give her a miracle. She had a backpack on. I thought that was different, but it had food in it, and she had a tube hanging out of that that went into her stomach here. I couldn't see all that. I just saw a little tube. But she got up the next morning, she, the tumor's gone. And she told me later, she's a nurse, a registered nurse, a very smart lady medically. And she said, I went to two of my surgeons that I know personally, friends of mine, and asked them to cut that out. And they said, we don't dare touch it because you got too many nerves in that. We're liable to paralyze you. I mean, I appreciate you thinking we could do it, but your best just to let it go right now. God just shrunk it and disappeared on her. She got a new, she got a new pancreas. I mean, just on and on I could go. This lady remarkable and I never met her before in my life she was a visitor to the service that night somebody invited her I said well Dr. Jacobs is coming and he has miracles I can't guarantee what he'll do or say but he does minister to the sick <laughs> she's so sweet I wanted to get up there first doctor but I just couldn't move that fast she's about the third up in the line ended up she ended up marrying my son she's a pastor now with her husband in the church. Pardon me? She ate like a chili dog that night. 
Yeah, ate a chili dog or something. Oh, she went home and had potatoes and honey mustard dressing. She called somebody and told us, I didn't, what does that mean? And she, then I found out later she hadn't eaten anything down her mouth for two years. Well, your whole system's been not accustomed to that. That's big stuff when you eat something like that and you hadn't had anything going through you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Jennifer, come up here a minute. Hallelujah. El Recibo. <laughs> El Recibo, good, because God's doing something fresh in your life right now. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Fresh, fresh, fresh. Fresh. Hallelujah. <clears throat> what are you doing? I'm just waiting on the Lord a second, see if there's anything else that we, you know, every service will be different. I tell that to people because, you know, I don't know about tomorrow night. Right now, I don't know. I'm not there. What all's going to happen? We've been talking about sharing on something. I'd never shared it before. I never preached the message until I was in Mexico City on Sunday morning. I've been going to countries for 35 years, over 110 mission trips, but no missionaries ever decided to tithe to me. <laughs> and this son down there, he's been a son for many years now, I don't know, 8 or 10 or 15. We knew each other for almost 20. And they've just, I don't know, it just blew me out. And I was going to teach a different message that Sunday, and the Lord said, teach this. I never, ever taught it before. I may teach it tomorrow night here because you guys are in the same, not the same predicament, but similar in that your pastors tithe to me. And I appreciate it. And we found scriptures that tells all the partners who are connected to Dr. Cody, your boats are going to get filled too. <laughs> hey, wow. That ought to be an encouragement to you. It's never about the money. It's about the honor you show. And I don't demand people to do any of this. When I say what I'm saying, you've got to know me, and I'm not sure you do, but it's not about the money. Somebody wants to hook up with me, I just say, well, read my book on spiritual fathers just to see if we're anywhere in the same ballpark. Because yeah. yeah. if you're, you know, you don't think like at least a little bit like I'm thinking, we're going to have conflict. Amen. And so, anyway. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God's doing something. This is a wonderful year, 2020. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 2020. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. A lot of you got new stuff tonight. And you go, you know, go back to the doctor if you need to. Be tested. I'm not, I'm not asking you to just do it without getting some, uh, you know, verification. Hallelujah. Things can change in a moment. When we're in faith, I'm in faith to release what I have, and you're in faith to receive it. It's mutual faith. Hallelujah. 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 Glory be to God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Oh. Thank you, Father. We worship you tonight. Thank you and bless you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Pastor Cody, I'm going to turn it back to you for tonight. Don't miss tomorrow night. Don't miss Wednesday night. That's right. We, just, we don't know. I don't know yet. Do you know? I don't know yet. <laughs> I don't know everything. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You just remain standing there. Yeah, you know, Amber and I, we live our lives by a few mottos. I don't know that I ever got her agreement on that. I just put it on her, but... Uh, one of them is uh, life is an adventure, an adventure of faith. And uh, those that had hands laid on you tonight, keep the switch of faith turned on. You heard him. She said, in the morning. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And I've been teaching in my church for Wednesday night for I don't know how many weeks. Walk by faith, faith not by sight. sight. Brother Hagin coined that term, I think. Keep the switch of faith. Turn on. Well, I didn't feel nothing. It's not based on feeling. That's walking by sight. What do you believe? And I'm going to bring this up I, because I, well, praise God, Holy Ghost. But, you know, where's Jesus fit in all this 
Angelica Siston, isn't he the healer? I just hear somebody saying that, maybe having that question. Well, he is the healer. First of all, none of this would be possible if he didn't pay for it. That's right. But did you know the Bible says over and over and over again that he is the Lord of hosts? Yes. Isn't that right? Yes. Especially in Malachi. He is the Lord of hosts. Hosts, what's that mean? The heavenly hosts. They all work for him. You do know Jesus is here by His Spirit, but He's got a high priestly ministry up there. He's got angelic emissaries all over. He's the Lord of the heavenly host. That doesn't mean He's not the healer. And you understand, I know doctor knows that, but I just felt like that maybe somebody had that question down on the inside. None of it's possible if Jesus didn't pay for it. Hallelujah. I just thank God for these things. And I've been in quite a few meetings with doctor. And what he says is really real. You know, you, what we had tonight, you just, every meeting will be different. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I read this recently. Uh, someone said, in your spirit-filled church, now that's, a, that's an important designation, but in your spirit-filled church, God has a plan for your perfection Amen. in every service. Amen. So see, when we miss unduly, it doesn't mean you have to be, you know, whatever. Don't get in bondage. I'm just saying that God has a plan to add something to your life in every service. Amen. And uh, so if, if he didn't minister specifically in one area of your body, I've heard him talk about how I prayed for, I had a word of knowledge about this, like he just said about Misty. He, she just asked for three things. She got healed of nine of them. Yeah. That healer didn't want to get out there and do things he didn't even call out. But he may call it out before the meeting's over. I'm just saying you got to not expect God to do everything in one service. If you're hungry, you'll be back. Amen. Well, Father, we just thank you for all that was uh, ministered to us tonight. Those that... Uh, Glory to God, we're ministered to for their bodies. We thank you, God. The anointing went in them. The anointing removes burdens. It destroys the yoke. Therefore, we can say confidently, they are well. They are healed. The power of God is working within them. And so, Lord, we get ready to leave this place rejoicing. Glory to God. And as I commission them, Father, I just say, God, they're going to go in the joy of the Lord, in the peace of God, and they'll stay that way all day, all night, all day tomorrow. Walking by faith and not by sight, not by how they feel. And God, I just thank you that you'll favor this meeting and you'll make a way for us to be here available every night. Bless them as they go. Cause them to be refreshed for whatever it is that they have to go do tomorrow. And we just thank you for it in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said... Amen. Well, we love you tonight. God bless you. You're dismissed tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Doors open at 6. We'll see you then. <laughs>